So welcome to our Meeting of the Minds discussion today. We're, we're going to be talking about the overview effect and self-transcendent experiences. I'm joined here by David Yaden, Anahida Nizami, and Frank White. Um, so guys, to get started, maybe if you could all just maybe introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your background and what got you interested in, in the work you're currently doing. So maybe we could start with Anahida here, ladies first, I, I suppose would be the best way. So I'm Anahita Nazami. I'm a counselling psychologist. I uh, have a clinic in uh, UK largely online at the moment. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the ROE, Virtual Reality Overview Effect. Um, and I'm looking into applying digital therapies based on the overview effect um, and self-transcendent experiences like the overview effect um, into clinical sort of uh, areas uh, and more broadly, I'm really advocating um, for evidence-based self-transcendent experiences and applications and treatments to be included in mental health um, uh, practices. Fantastic. Um, Frank, do you wanna do you wanna jump in next? Sure, yeah. So Frank White, I'm an author, writer, researcher, and I suppose I've been interested in space exploration pretty much all of my life, since my mother gave me a book on astronomy when I was 10. And I've been trying to understand what President Kennedy called the meaning of space exploration all along, all those years. I got into the overview effect through an experience on an airplane where I was thinking about what it would be to live in outer space permanently and I had a self-transcendent experience, I suppose we'd call it. And uh, I thought they would have an overview, these people of the future, and uh, they would experience the overview effect. And so from that day forward, which was more than 30 years ago, I have been exploring this phenomenon, most recently, of course, interviewing astronauts as proxies for future space people. And I guess the other aspect of it, and that's why I enjoy working with Anahita and David, I've always been interested in psychotherapy, mental health, personal growth. And I'm very interested in how the experience and the idea and the theory of the overview effect can be applied to everyday life. Fantastic. Okay, David, do you want to do you want to share? Sure. I'm David Yaden. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Johns Hopkins in the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit, and specifically in the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. And let's see, uh, I came, my, my interest in the overview effect started uh, during my doctoral training uh, at, at Penn where I was interested in brief experiences that could have long-term positive effects. Uh, particularly, I was interested in altered states of consciousness of that kind, not just winning the lottery or, or getting married, but, but brief moments that seem to happen entirely behind the eyes, so to speak, uh, that change people in a positive way. And so, you know, I'm interested in studying this from all sorts of perspectives, psychology and neuroscience, but one way is to collect accounts of these kinds of experiences. And so you see them in monastic traditions, you see them in normal people, uh, all, all kinds of different triggers. And through the course of that research, I stumbled upon a quote from an astronaut, and it was probably from Frank's book or an article based on uh, his book on the overview effect. And I was amazed at how similar that astronaut's description of their self-transcendent experience from viewing Earth from orbit matched with the kinds of transformative experiences that are maybe more typical in a, in a meditation kind of environment, uh, you know. And so that really struck me. And then of course, uh, I really found Frank's work and, and saw that he had compiled dozens uh, or even hundreds of these, these accounts. And so that got me very, very interested in uh, the overview effect in terms of astronauts who are having these uh, self-transcendent experiences. 
uh, as well as the profound symbol, I think, of seeing Earth from above or from beyond and what that means to us as a species. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe I'll just add, uh, given my normal or my, my psychedelic research that I'm mostly focusing on now, there seems to be an, an interesting overlap between how people describe psychedelic experiences and how astronauts are describing the overview effect. Uh, Michael Pollan's recent book, How to Change Your Mind, uh, discussed this at, at great length, actually, this, and he uses the term, the overview effect, uh, very frequently. So I hope we'll, we'll talk about that at some point in our discussion today. Definitely. I think uh, just to add on to uh, everyone's talked about sort of how they came across the overview effect and their interests. So I think it might be worthwhile me adding uh, sort of my journey there. So uh, in terms of um, the overview effect, I was actually interested in sort of near death experiences um, uh, and trying to sort of think about um, self transcendent experiences um, and near death experiences being some near-death experiences obviously um, bringing about self-transcendence um, because uh, for individual people. So anyway, I couldn't find participants. It was very difficult to find the participants. And uh, I was reading around self-transcendence and higher states of you know, consciousness and altered states of consciousness and, um, I, and trying to really tr think about my research direction. And uh, it, it was quite late at night and I came across Frank's book and uh, his work um, and uh, really was inspired. And so I actually tweeted him, I, and if I recall, it was quite late at night, I tweeted him, it was almost in the moment captured sort of uh, my manic um, wanting to find my research um, idea. And anyway, I tweeted uh, Frank and um, what, didn't think for a moment he'd get back and you know just sort of went out of my mind and suddenly a few days later, I got a sort of response back and that he was interested in, um, so we started a dialogue and from there, um, Frank kindly assisted in um, sort of um, putting me in touch with some of his uh, research participants for his book, some NASA, retired NASA astronauts and uh, the rest is history. And then I interviewed seven retired NASA astronauts, did an IPA qualitative um, piece, which I think David and I had a conversation about um, some years ago. Um, and from that, that's how VROE sort of was born from that research and Frank's work and conversations with people like David, um, uh, that, that's how sort of VROE was born. So I think that's probably relevant to also mention. Brilliant. Um, I'd love to go back and maybe try and find that tweet that you tweeted, Frank, all those years Do it. ago. Yes, I'm uh, trying to find that tweet as well. <laughs> um, I'm just I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page that's listening, listening back home. Um, but I think it's important to get clear in our definitions first. So for anyone that isn't aware of what the overview effect is, um, maybe Frank, if you could just give us a brief sort of explanation of what that is. And then whenever we're talking about self-transcendence, um, you know, what, what are we talking about there as well? Hmm. Well, uh, I've defined the overview effect as an astronaut experience of seeing the earth from space and in space. That is to say, from low earth orbit, which is from space, or from a lunar mission where you really see the whole earth and uh, you see it at a greater distance, of course. And uh, that's, that's seeing the earth in space. And so that's the very simple definition, but I think it's, reasonable to say too a couple of things one is it's it's a theory there's overview effect theory and that means there's a hypothesis and my hypothesis was originally about uh future space dwellers but it's evolved because of the interviews with astronauts to be a different hypothesis which is that if we could bring this awareness, this capability, this, uh, this perspective down to earth and apply it in various ways, uh, like Anahita is trying to do with VROE, uh, I think that David's looking to do it with psychedelic research. If we could reproduce something like the experience, of interconnectedness and we're all in this together, 
it would actually make the earth a better place or our life on earth a better place. So it's a theory as well as an experience and therefore it can evolve, it can change. And uh, there's a lot of conversations going on right now about similar experiences uh, and how similar are they and, and how are they different from what the astronauts experience. But as I said, the strict definition is an astronaut experience, but it really broadens from there. Fantastic. Okay, David, on the self-transcendent side of things, how would you how would you describe that through your work? Yeah. So, self-transcendent experiences. Uh, this is a term that I think is best thought of as a kind of umbrella term, and it's defined as transient mental state involving feelings of connectedness and self-loss. And this overall umbrella concept uh, includes a number of very well-studied uh, psychological constructs like flow, uh, like mindfulness, like awe, uh, like peak experiences, and even mystical type experiences. And so there's kind of a rough spectrum of intensity and these various experiences have lots of differences between them, uh, but they seem to share this, uh, this aspect of enhancing feelings of connectedness and involving uh, momentary feelings of self-loss. And so one of the ways that I tried to look at Frank's concept of the overview effect and ground it in empirical uh, <laughs> contemporary research uh, was to describe uh, the overview effect uh, in terms of a self-transcendent experience. So, so in my way of thinking, the overview effect is, is a kind of a trigger uh, for this, this altered state of consciousness that we could call a self-transcendent experience, um, but there are other triggers as well. So that, that's my way of, of trying to conceptualize this area. Fantastic. Now, why, why are self-transcendent experiences so important? Because I think you've, you've studied this across cultures, is that right? And you've, this, this seems to be quite a universal thing amongst human cultures all over the world. Is that, is that fair to say? I think so. You have to be careful of, of assuming that people everywhere are having the exact same experiences because differences in, in culture and language and traditions do create some differences, but there also seems to be some cluster of, of similar features. Uh, these feelings of enhanced connectedness and transient self-loss appear to be uh, pretty cross-culturally uh, universal, I would say. Um, and I should say, you know, I'm a research psychologist, so I'm, I don't really apply these kinds of experiences in the way that Anahita was describing. I'm interested in in understanding them from a kind of a neutral perspective. Um, but when you do that as a quantitatively oriented empirical psychologist, you can't help but notice that the vast majority of people having these experiences results in quite positive effects. 100%. And in terms of- the Not always though, and I uh, should note that. Yeah. Okay, okay. And in terms of the overview, overview effect, Frank and Anahita, you know, what would you say the importance of um, bringing more awareness to this idea just to the general public? You know, what, why is this an important idea for the average person, but also for society as a whole? So um, just to go back on uh, this slightly just to, to what David um, was, was saying in, in terms of self-transcendence. So I think um, with my own learning or through my journey in self-transcendence in applying it with my clients as well as uh, in, in certain specific um, areas where, there's, where it's suitable um, and also my own sort of journeys in self-transcendence I think it's the, the ego diminishment or complete dissolving of the ego is, is also I think there's a misconception around self-transcendence that the ego has to completely dissolve and that you know you are left with this sort of state of egolessness, um, and actually there's different sort of um, levels of intensity 
with self-transcendence and there's different types and forms of self-transcendence. And I think that's really important to add on uh, what Frank and David were, were saying, um, because uh, there's that, to really try to um, uh, get over that misconception because um, that can often lead to um, problems uh, in, in clinical practice where people think that the ego has to completely diminish and there's no ego left and it's a permanent state. And as David was saying, it's also often, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a positive and there's a negative and um, sort of aspects of self-transcendence dependent on the person and um, their, the, the, the personality factors, individual factors, um, and perhaps their, their ability to tolerate the, the, the states um, associated with self-transcendence. Um, and so um, oftentimes um, states, um, dissociative states can be associated with uh, rightly or wrongly with um, self-transcendence and dissociative states of course are often um, with you know um, borderline personality disorder uh, or um, uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder are often um, symptoms that can manifest with that however it it, it, it is often inaccurately associated with self-transcendence um, but more research needs to be done in that area for sure. Um, so back to your question on applications, I think it was on uh, of VR, virtual reality. Sorry, what was your question uh, before that? No. It's just really around the importance of, of these experiences for the, for the average person. You know, why, mm -hmm. why is it important that we have these experiences in our lives? So I think um, in terms of, I, I see it in a way that, you know, I think we have a limited view of self. Um, and I think some of that's been imposed upon by culture, um, and by society. And uh, I don't necessarily have, you know, I don't think that our culture is bad or wrong. I think we're in sort of adolescent sort of developmental stage of our culture, um, certainly in the West I'm talking about more specifically at the moment. So, and what I think has happened is that it's led to, although it's changing um, a certain, at this point, a certain sort of limited view of self for many of us that where we see the self as um, individualistic, separate, um, uh, you know, entity, um, and and that has created um, a version of self that I think, as I said, is limited. And I think actually there are um, other versions that can be included that will help us um, feel more connected to the world that we live in. And so self-transcendence is this idea of connecting with things beyond us in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with uh, the nature, with nature, cosmos is part of nature and with each other and animals and so on. So, um, so I think it can be helpful in just reminding people. And of course now modern science is beginning to back this idea of uh, we are all connected and this sort of field theory, um, quantum physics, please don't ask me too much around that. But, you know, in terms of we, it's now supporting that view, the self-transcendent view that we are connected. But from where I'm approaching it is I'm not discounting the individualistic self. I think it's important to be almost shifting gears and be able to mm. um, tolerate and accept that they are all parts of us. Um, so, you know, we can't be in self-transcendent states all the time at this point, at this juncture in civilization, um, perhaps in a thousand years, we don't know where we'll be. But, you know, at this point, I think it kind of, we need to be able to shift gears and it's healthy to do so for most or for many people. Yeah. I bet you there's somebody listening home just thinking, I can try, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Frank, have you got anything to add there just about the importance of uh, bringing more awareness to this? Sure, a couple of things. One is on the individual level, the other is on the societal level. Uh, building on what Anahita was talking about, I think if you as an individual can get an overview of your life, it will make more sense. And uh, my I am not a psychotherapist, but I've trained in it. And I've always felt like what a psychotherapist does is try to give you an overview, uh, an overview perspective, if you will, because if you can get above the everyday chaos that we <laughs> exist in, uh, you can see a certain order and coherence and you can see, well, hopefully you can see, well, I'm in the situation I'm in because I did X, Y, and Z, for example, very simple. I actually have started working on my memoir, uh, perhaps a little early and a little uh, 
uh, egotistically to be writing my memoir, but um, I, I'm doing it as an experiment. I'm calling it my life as seen from orbit. So what I'm trying to do is apply what I've learned about the overview effect to my own life as a template for uh, this idea of applying this to your own life. And so far I've gotten through what I call orbits one through six. Uh, we would call them years, years one through six. I found it very effective. I've had insights about my life that I don't think I would have had in any other way. And then for society, uh, one of the phrases I like is that a planet has no sides. When you see the earth from a distance, you see a whole system totally interconnected, totally interwoven. What happens on one side of the earth affects the other side. And you see it clearly as the metaphor has it a spaceship and we're all the crew on it, but we don't act that way. So the planet doesn't have sides, but we create sides immediately. Uh, you know, I'm on the right, you're on the left. You know, I'm on this side, you're on that side. And one application I'm working on with some colleagues at Harvard is how could we apply the overview effect to conflict resolution? Mm -hmm. In other words, why do you have conflict? Well, you're on your side, I'm on, I'm on my side. Well, can we show people that there are no sides really? And that as the astronauts tell me in the interviews, no matter how different you feel from that person over there, you're connected. Uh, you're a part of a common destiny. We don't know yet if it's gonna work. It's kind of, you know, we're, we're all at an early stage of trying to see if we can bring this uh, idea down to earth. But that's the practical benefit if we could if we could help people see their lives differently, it would help individuals. If we could help nations see their conflicts differently, I, I don't think I have to emphasize how valuable that would be. Uh, if we could help individuals see their conflicts differently, would be great. And final point, you know, metaphorically, we call the Earth a spaceship, but we don't see it. If you go to the International Space Station and you live there for a year, you're going to get in conflict with the other astronauts. It's inevitable. Uh, I'm sure they have conflicts we don't know about. But what they tell me is, well, you have to work them out. There is no alternative. You have to work together every day. And you know, unlike on Earth, if you get upset with your spouse, you can go take a walk. Well, on the ISS, that's called a spacewalk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, by the time you put that spacesuit on and you got ready and you arranged to go on a spacewalk, you'd probably be over it. But the point is, uh, you have to work it out. And I think one of the things we haven't realized as a society is we have to work it out. This is it. This is what we have, this planet. And uh, we we really have no choice but to work things out more effectively than we have. 100%. Um, um, Niall, can I just um, step in just to uh, butt in a second around what Frank was saying, which is very interesting in terms of, um, you know, psychotherapy and really at the crux of psychotherapy is this idea of regulation. So self-regulation, you know, in terms of helping our clients regulate their internal worlds and helping them learn the skills to do that effectively themselves. But also uh, Frank was um, nicely summing up this, the, another important thing in uh, psychotherapy is this perspective shift and the flexibility to be able to shift perspectives, um, which is also around resilience and flexibility and, and these important things that help us stay in healthier mental states for longer um, you know, periods. And so I think there the are really two important things that he picked up on that are so relevant for everyday work that we do as therapists um, in applied psychology, but also in any of the um, interventions or treatments that we create. At the core of them must be this ability to shift perspectives 
and to push people even sometimes in doing so outside of their frame of reference because you're helping them see a different perspective and that can be uncomfortable sometimes. Um, but also in terms of the regulation and using self-transcendence to help people um, step outside of themselves to understand themselves, but then also to self, self-regulate as well. That's a, that's a very good point, Danny. Thanks, thanks for sharing. There's actually, there's a guy called uh, John Vervecki. Are, are you guys aware of this gentleman? Um, he's, a, he's a lecturer at the University of Toronto and he, he talks about the role of uh, the shaman in these sort of ancient tribal societies. And he was saying that basically their role was always to help the local people shift their perspective out of their ordinary day-to-day life and give them, as Frank says, like an overview of their of their life so they can sort of put things in context and see what the important things are. Um, so relevant anyway. and to psychedelics as well, you know, I mean, that's often reported. I think David will tell us a bit more about what is and what isn't reported, but you know, um, that's often reported where, you know, or near death experiences or psychedelics where, you know, different types of self transcendent experiences where people have this overview and where they, you know, look at their life from this different perspective. Yeah. 100%. So maybe this is a good point to transition into, into David's work in uh, psychedelics. So you're, you're a leading researcher in this field, David. So I'd just be curious to ask, you know, what are you, what are you learning? What's, what, are the, what are the latest updates? And, you know, why is this such an important area of research at the minute? Yeah, thanks. Well, one thing I want to go back to a little bit that Anahita and Frank were talking about is this this idea of uh, the self loss component uh, or the the ego dissolution is, I think, probably emphasized more so in research on altered states of consciousness in general, such as those coming from meditation or awe and definitely in the world of psychedelic research as well. But, you know, if you'll remember, the definition of self-transcendent experience had had two components. It has this enhanced feeling of connectedness as well as uh, diminished uh, salience of the self. And so the the emphasis on self-loss or ego dissolution, I think is actually misplaced. I think there should be uh, much more emphasis on these feelings of connectedness. And we have data suggesting that that's actually where the therapeutic action is, is in this, these feelings of connectedness, mm-hmm. feelings of self-loss come along for the ride, so to speak. Um, but, but it seems like these um, reported feelings of connectedness are really what drive the, the benefits for well-being uh, or for therapeutic effects. And I think that changes maybe a little bit of the way that we we talk about these uh, altered states of consciousness, or these self transcendent experiences, and even these shifts in perspective that Frank and Andy, Anahita were mentioning. Um, you know, I think we go around uh, very often feeling like there's me on the one hand, and then there's everything else and everyone else on the other hand, and we we kind of give those equal wait, uh, even though, you know, it's just little old me. And I think in these, in these experiences, we do get a, a, a more properly proportioned view uh, sometimes when we feel connected to other people and other things, uh, we become much more aware of what's, what's going on around us and in our entire existential situation. And that shift in focus from, from oneself to, to everything else and, and other people has a tremendous amount of therapeutic value. You know, we know that feeling isolated uh, is extremely detrimental. And we know that feeling social connectedness is extremely beneficial uh, for very uh, deep evolutionary reasons. And so I think that there's something about these experiences that's, that's tapping into that. Um, in terms of why astronauts who are viewing Earth from orbit are having similar experiences to people lying on a couch with eye shades on after being administered a psychedelic like psilocybin, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I have some ideas, but it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue but it's one that I'm fascinated by. 
uh, the, the subjective self-report is quite similar, um, but the triggers seem quite different. But it may be that certain kinds of triggers uh, result in certain kinds of, of mental states and that those could be either pharmacological, uh, as in the case of psychedelics, or, or perceptual. And so there's this literature on the emotion of awe uh, which is defined as being triggered by the perception of vastness. And that vastness can be sort of visual, like, you know, seeing uh, amazing scenery, or it can be conceptual, like hearing a theory that seems to explain everything or a grand and inspiring idea. And one thing that I think might be going on with the overview effect is you have you have both of these forms of vastness at once. You're seeing one of the most sweeping, uh, vast and beautiful scenes that any human eye has ever witnessed on the one hand, but you're also recognizing uh, that everything that we care about in the world <laughs> and even that expression, <laughs> you know, everything we care about is right there in the world. Um, and, it, and it drives home the, I think the fragility of our existential situation, as well as the kind of connectedness uh, that Frank and Anahito were mentioning. Uh, so those are some thoughts on some of the overlaps. I think that there's probably more, uh, and, and I'd love to, to hear other ideas about this. Yeah, you know, one, one thing to add is that when we talk about the overview effect, there are aspects of what I still put under the broad category of the overview effect that aren't really quite the same. So for example, if an astronaut says, I looked at the earth and I knew before I went that there were no borders or boundaries there and no little colored maps, but seeing it was really startling. So that's, that's one aspect of it. And I hear that a lot. I, you know, I hear that there's a difference between knowing something intellectually, knowing it experientially. So I would call that the overview effect. Was that a self-transcendent experience? Maybe so, maybe not. On the other hand, Edgar Mitchell famously on the way back from the moon, clearly connected with the entire universe had a, uh, oceanic feeling, I think is the term. Uh, he had a, he had connectedness to the universe and a diminishment of ego, all, all happening at once. I still put that under the overview effect, but I called it something else. I called it the universal insight. It just seemed much more powerful. And when he came back and asked people, what the heck happened to me? because he couldn't quite categorize it, somebody told him, well, you experienced samadhi. That brings us right back to what Anahita and David are talking about, because the pursuit of that experience and the experience itself is well known to uh, spiritual practitioners. So there's another connection between earthbound experiences and astronaut experiences. There's one other thing I want to say. There is an aspect to being an astronaut that is unique and very different from being on the earth. And that is microgravity or what we call weightlessness. I don't think that's been explored enough as a component of the overview effect. Um, and it may actually go back to what David mentioned about psychedelics uh there may be a, it it and i'm just speculating here david but th there may be a feeling of weightlessness that happens you know with psychedelics i'm not sure but my point is we know scientifically that the entire body is dramatically affected by moving out of the earth's gravity field uh, i mean every organ in the body is adapts immediately you know um the heart starts pumping less quickly the bones start shedding calcium 
uh, astronauts act, actually grow a couple of inches in length, their legs get skinnier, their muscles get less, uh, you know, powerful. Oh, and then there's this other organ called the brain. Something happens to the brain too. And I think it has that, all of that has an effect on the experience as a whole. And generally when I talk about the overview effect, people see it as a visual experience, but the brain is intimately involved in interpreting what happens visually. So we need to do a lot more work on that. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, interesting. And of course the brain is involved in everything, <laughs> uh, but it, you raise a really insightful point. And again, this is all just speculation here now in a place that caveat firmly in place, but in research on the emotion of awe, for example, Mikhail Van Elk has shown that there's very frequently a disruption of uh, one's bodily boundaries or where one feels themselves to be uh, in, in space, I mean, in one's surroundings. And Andrew Newberg's work has shown that uh, spiritual adepts, uh, Tibetan meditators and Franciscan nuns, when they report feeling deep uh, sensations of unity, the region of their brain that seems to map these bodily boundaries is inhibited. And so maybe it can work the other way when your bodily boundaries are in flux due to this kind of disorienting experience of microgravity. Maybe uh, it could uh, sort of blur these boundaries and result in the kinds of feelings of connectedness uh, that people report. That's all very, very speculative, um, but it's an interesting connection uh, to where one feels themselves to be in space bodily appears to have uh, important connections to one's uh, mental state. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Now, what do we know about what's actually happening in the brain during a self-transcendent experience? You know, what, what's going on, going on there? Well, it's interesting. I, I just, I'm still thinking about this. And uh, in William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, there's, there's a footnote and it refers to an article in the Atlantic at the time. This is 1901 probably, or, or well, it would have been maybe more, more 1899. Um, and it refers uh, to uh, a brilliant researcher at Harvard uh, who, uh, she, she was never awarded a, a doctoral degree due to rampant sexism, um, but she had this really wonderful idea and I'll find her name. Um, but she described that what might be going on in these, these profound mystical type experiences is a mismatch between uh, one's habitual motor activities and where one is relative to their surroundings. Uh, so this, this idea that's received some empirical support uh, actually has, is over a century old. And yeah, now I'm very curious whether that might be playing, playing a role to, to Frank's point. I hadn't thought of that. I was more so thinking that the, the, the scenery, the beauty, the vastness, and the meaningfulness through the eyes were, were creating this experience, um, but there could be something having to do with just being in microgravity as well. Uh, that might that might be at least an enhancing effect. Again, total speculation there. Yeah. One thing uh, I want to give Anahita a chance to jump in, uh, but <laughs> but I do want to say when I talk to astronauts, and I bet you had the same experience, Anahita. They talk about the beauty of the planet in ways that seem hyper uh, sensitive. You know, they say the the bluest blue you've ever seen, uh, the deepest blue, the greens, the browns of the desert. There's something about it that's not just because they're in orbit looking at the Earth. It's something. Intent, it's intensification of, of it. And that goes back to, well, what's going on? And is that microgravity or something else? 
I don't know, mm -hmm. Anahita, when you interviewed astronauts, you pick up on that too, right? I did, I did. And um, I picked on, on lots of little nuances, um, you know, all the astronauts. I mean, my, my study was quite small. Um, it's a qualitative study, but I, I've also noticed it, to be uh, honest, in, in um, your interviews, Frank, and um, uh, some of the work other people have done, you know, possessive language. So using, hip, you know, um, uh, her to refer to Earth um, or possessive language as in our Earth, you know, my Earth or, you know, that kind of um, um, structuring of words is, was interesting. Um, and I think also just uh, the inability to sometimes describe, apart from Nicole uh, Stott, who um, was, you know, very um, uh, varied vocabulary and she was more able to sort of succinctly put it into words as, as, as you know as best as she could many of the um, astronauts found it difficult to find the words to describe the, the feelings and what they saw but as Frank rightly said the focus often went, went back to the beauty and the magnificence of planet earth um, and really, I think um, the beauty was beyond just beauty. It was more about sublime and trying to capture the sublime, which is where sort of, uh, in terms of the work we're doing with the ROE is really looking at sublime and sublime art and you know, celestial scenes that kind of can tap into that. Um, and I think that that's where that sort of um, difficulty in describing the experience comes from because what they were seeing was so powerful and so profound. Um, and, you know, Joseph Allen was having reoccurring dreams about um, his experience all the way up to the point where I interviewed him. Anyway, I haven't spoken to him since to see if it's still happening. So that's really profound, you know, to think about um, how impactful it, it had been on those people that I interviewed. Um, but of course, there's cultural differences. But I, I suspect that, you know, um, for example, with um, Russian um, cosmonauts, uh, they, they tend to describe it. A little bit differently and they don't talk about the sort of universal values in a, quite the same way and they focus more on the beauty um uh you know that the, they, they recognize earth is beautiful and interconnected but they might not go into the spiritual aspects as much in some ways um and and that's interesting it's an interesting difference but i mean there's lots of explanations to why that may arise and it could be to do with language it could be to do with culture it could be to do with the profession um and it could be to do with integration. So it could be to do that there takes uh, some time to integrate the experience. And oftentimes what we find is that retired astronauts tend to, um, well, maybe less so now, but, but certainly there, there was a point where retired astronauts might talk about these things a bit more openly upon, you know, upon leaving um, uh, their, their, their role. So yes, um, I think um, it, it's interesting. I was really listening to the microgravity conversations and thinking about um, how it affects um, astronauts. And I think, I think there is something to that, that, it, that, that does add, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience that is really, you can't extract it out from the launch and from, you know, microgravity and from the expectations. And if you want to go down, you know, um, Jung kind of, you know, these ty types of ideas that we have in our mind of what, what it will be like. Um, these archetypes, you know, of what what planet Earth will look like and feel like and be like, and so I think um, all of these you can't really take them apart. But I, I do think that um, microgravity. I think there's a sort of um, neurological sort of um, component to what happens to the mind from a personal um, uh, experience of what the astronauts um, sort of tell us is that actually weightlessness is important. But actually, because it's happening all the time, and if you're it's six months on the International Space Station or nine months, that actually becomes quite commonplace. So from their own, you know, from, from not all of them, but for many of them, that sort of that becomes every day, in a sense. And they're living it, they're doing it. It just becomes automatic. It's not, it's not a big deal. Um, so from that sort of personal experience, I don't know if it makes. Um, that much of a difference, but certainly it might be something that primes self-transcendence in the sense of being disconnected and sort of floating around and being disconnected, sort of, you can see how that could really sort of support a self-transcendent experience of, you know, whilst you're watching planet Earth and then being weightless and, and, and that could lead to more sort of a profound experience perhaps, yeah. Yeah, and I think with that, there's a novelty element, um, right? You know, when you're looking out your 
airplane window, it is pretty awe inspiring, at least for me initially. And then I get bored of it pretty quick and go <laughs> back to my book or whatever. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, we adapt as, as humans, but, but that initial, uh, rush of not only the view and the meaning, but also how one's body feels, uh, due to microgravity could, could all have a com a, a, a synergistic kind of effect. Um, I also just want to add this uh, before we move on. I, I found uh, the name of the, the researcher. It was Ethel Puffer uh, who wrote a piece in the Atlantic, um, which was published in 1900. And she said, the vanishing of the sense of self and the feeling of immediate unity is due to the disappearance in these rapturous experiences of the motor adjustments, which habitually intermediate between the constant background of consciousness, which is the self, and the constant foreground, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, so I, I found that absolutely prescient, and uh, I don't think uh, Ethel Puffer gets enough credit for that that insight. Um, I, I write about her in my. Uh, I have a book coming out um, early next year uh, called "The Varieties of Spiritual Experience." Uh, so hopefully. Uh, she'll she'll uh, get some of the credit that she's due. Fantastic, fantastic! So you're like the William James of the 21st century, then? Uh -huh. Oh, I, I would yes. never uh, put myself <laughs> up, up there, but uh, I I certainly see myself as someone who wants to point back to James and get people to to read him and and be excited about his work and ideas because I think it's it's really just as relevant as ever. Um, I'm shocked, you know, by you know the the book the varieties of religious experience uh really just lays the foundation for this whole area of study of of altered states of consciousness or transformative experiences and, yeah. Uh, yeah that's that's my mission i want people to go back and read that book uh and to and to work on some of those ideas uh, because there's all kinds of theories and hypotheses in there um, and, and many of which are relevant to astronauts uh, floating around in orbit, which is uh, probably something that he barely could imagine being possible uh, back in 1900. But, yeah. you know, people like Richard James and Carl Jung and all these sort of um, early pioneers in, in many ways, David and Frank, you know, they, they have done um, so much groundwork, breaking work. Um, and they had so much foresight, similarly to Frank, in terms of some of the hypothesis and, um, you know, it, it was before their time. And, you know, to put your neck out in that way, um, uh, to sort of talk about these ideas that are controversial, that later on, you know, people then like Rupert Sheldrick, uh, is, uh, who talks about sort of morphic resonance and um, obviously quantum physics now is talking about all of these sort of um, uh, the field and, 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 you know, everything is waves and connected and, and, and they, they put their neck out in a sense to talk about these, whether it's self-transcendence or whether it's about sort of um, talking about, you know, um, archetypes and talking about sort of the, 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 these, these kinds of ideas that people back then would completely frown upon, I'm sure, but somehow the, the voice was loud, they kept persisting and, you know, it got through. Um, but it's incredible to see the foresight of, of um, the psychological forefathers, if you want, will, um, in, in uh, um, the, the, you know, who advocated for the, these methods all the way back back then in the 19th century. A hundred percent. Now, just before, okay. probably got time for one more question before before we um, end end the call. Um, you know, for someone listening to this at home. What, what are their options in terms of cultivating more self-transcendent experiences in their in their day-to-day -day life? Like, do you guys do anything regularly to keep this perspective in mind of, you know, like you say, Frank, we're, we're on spaceship Earth here and we often need reminders of that. We're, you just automatically know that, you know? So I'm just curious, how do you cultivate awareness of this the situation we're actually in in your in day-to-day your -day lives? Okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go on, on this one. So, so personally, I, I tend to meditate and the, the way, I mean, to be specific, there's different types of meditation that I've, you know, the older I get, the more I meditate, to be fair. Um, so it's, it seems like, you know, it's something that's becoming, you know, the, the developmental milestones of 40 and then 50 and 60, I think there is something and Ericsson um, talks about this in terms of 
um, you moving towards self transcendence with with age, you know, and so I, I'm practicing it more and more, and I tend to go for a run or a walk, and uh, I tend to try to connect with with the universal kind of energies, if you want, um, in that way. So, you know, breathing exercises after my run or walk, and I tend to sit under a tree if I can, if it's you know doing something with nature and connecting with nature in that way. Um, but day to day, I think generally just, you know, participating in what we call um, mindfulness of everyday living and trying to capture these three or four minutes or five minutes during the day where you can really just connect with your breath and connect with um, your internal world and the external world. You can you can do both. Um, so I, I use sort of mindfulness of everyday living, so in the shower or, you know, just walking and just the breathing exercises and, uh, you know, really connect with, with myself, my inner world. And also when I, when I go for a run, I think with my clients, we, we tend to often, you know, um, practice various types of visualization. And I think one thing that might be relevant here, one of the visualizations that, Frank, I think you'll like this one, um, but one of the visualizations that we practice is imagine you're an astronaut um, and you're following the sort of breath into um, the body um, so and um, and where does that sort of astronaut go and where does the focus go and they're riding the wave you know of the breath in the body um, and this is quite a nice way to um, connect people you know using this sort of astronaut idea um, and finally just to say that you know and I, was, I also have um, you know um, I use the stars. I meditate sometimes in the evening. I can see outside. I can see the stars when when it's a clear night. And I often like to look at the stars and meditate and connect with the universe in that way. It's something that brings me deep, deep fulfillment and peace. Um, and I've been doing that since I was a kid, you know, um, connecting with the stars. And we all have this, most of us have this wanting to know you know this seeking to find out you know we're all on this journey together in that sense we have a start point of this life anyway and an end point of this life and we all want to know what's what's what are, are we eternal beings or are we not are we connected are we not will we what's after death and i think these types of practices helps me find peace because I t seem to find these connections and these um, something beyond the self in a sense that mm -hmm. takes me outside of my, my body in a sense. So yeah, that's my... Thanks, Anita. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty boring, um, but luckily I have a, a job as a scientist where I can be in awe of uh, an idea or a finding basically on a daily basis. Um, other than that, uh, you know, I, I sit and watch my breath for, for 20 minutes because I'm kind of an anxious person that helps relax me. Uh, always I get a, a vision of calmness, David. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a dose of awe on a daily walk, uh, you know, Baltimore Harbor, for example, uh, you know, anywhere really, um, uh, you know, there's there's generally some kind of natural beauty or, or some kind of museum around to cl close enough for most people to, to check out. And I think those are uh, all uh, hot spots. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, the, the kinds of experiences that I'm really interested in these, these transformative kinds of experiences, they're, they're, they're quite rare, you know, they'll happen maybe once or twice in a lifetime. And so, I don't try to give any kind of advice about how to go about finding one of those, but I'm interested uh, when people have them um, on their own uh, because they do happen quite a bit. And I, I want people to know that they're not alone in having had that kind of experience um, and, and that generally they're, they're quite positive and can be integrated uh, very well. So that's, that's uh, something I hope to get out there fantastic and frank yeah well i meditate every day and i pray every day uh without fail if i don't i definitely notice the day becoming somewhat incoherent so I, it's a habit and and a good one i also i do try to remind myself every day you're on a spaceship you're on a spaceship you're on a spaceship i just 
It's very difficult. Our experience does not confirm it. That's the difference between us and real astronauts. Their experience confirms the Earth as a kind of a natural spacecraft. And I would say the other thing is I have an animal companion named Bella. And because of that, I have to take a walk every day. And I make every effort not to talk on the phone and not to get distracted and just to uh, be present to what I see on this walk. And you know, I have to tell you, uh, I actually had a self-transcendent experience walking with Bella and I can't fully explain it, but just for a moment, I had what I think the Zen Buddhist calls a kensho, just a moment of enlightenment, I would call it, and it went away. And I don't know why it happened right at that moment or what brought it on, but again, it is important to, for people to understand that everyday life, and th this is actually one of the great teachings of Zen Buddhism, everyday life gives us everything we need uh, to have self-transcendent experiences, but we have to uh, be present to, their, to the opportunity. That's a, that's a great uh, point to end on, Frank. Thank you very much for sharing. You know, just from my own experience, my, my issue is that I'm always busy and always in a rush and I'm always going too fast, but I find I get closer to these moments whenever I just slow down and I'm out for that walk, whatever, that's when they seem to happen, you know? So but anyway, I want to say thank you so much to all three of you. It's been, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. I've loved every minute. Um, so where can people find you all online? Uh, Anahita, do you want to go first there and just maybe, maybe a, link, a link to your website or something like that? Yeah, so um, vr-overview-effect.co.uk. It's a bit of a mouthful, that one. Um, but uh, so, yeah, just visit that website and you can find a bit more. Um, or you can sort of um, tweet me at, at Dr. Anahita and uh, VROE. Um, uh, is where on Instagram is where you can find us. But we're we're currently going to be with VROE um, going to universities and doing some hopefully some citizen science also um, uh, uh, research projects. Um, so hopefully you'll hear a bit more about us um, and um, how we're intending to apply and research um, VROE applications and uh, treatments. Awesome. Yeah, and you can just Google my name, David Gaden, uh, to find some of my work. And you can find me on Twitter, probably the same way, but uh, my handle is at existwell. Cool, cool. And Frank? Oh, it's very easy. Frankwhiteauthor.com. Okay. All my books are there. And I wish I, wish I was named a simpler name. <laughs> 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 yeah, I understand what you mean, but uh, it's kind of boring to have such a simple name, honestly. It's good, it's good for online, though. <laughs> Sorry, Frank, go ahead. What were you telling us about where you can find you? So Frank White. FrankWhiteAuthor.com. And uh, that's where all my books are. This podcast link will be there. Everything will be there. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much, guys, and enjoy the rest of your evenings. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Niall.